It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Charles Nemiroff. Uh, Dr. Nemiroff is the Matthew P. Nemiroff Professor and Chair in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He's also Chair of the Department um, at the uh, Dell uh, University of Texas at Austin Dell um, Medical School. He has a very long CV and he's a very well-known figure in the field of psychiatry, but let me just say a, a few things. Um, uh, he um, Received his medical degree and doctorate degrees in neurology from the University of uh, uh, North Carolina School of Medicine. He's been a previous chair at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and also at um, uh, Emory. He's received a number of research and education awards, including, including the Morazic Award in Psychiatric Pharmacogenetics, um, the, the, uh, Judge, Ju the Judson Marmer Award and the Vestamark Award from the American Psychiatric Association, the Mood Disorders Award, Bowes Award, and Dean Award from the American College of Psychiatrists, and the Julius Axelrod uh, Award for mentoring from uh, the ACN um, and ACNP. He's also received a number of honorary uh, degrees. Um, you may know his name uh, from uh, the textbook of psychopharmacology, which he uh, co-edited with uh, Alan Schatzberg, um, which was published by APA Press and is now in its uh, fifth edition. He's co-editor-in-chief of a new journal published by Elsevier called Personalized Medicine and Psychiatry, and he is president of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And on a personal note, he has been a, me a mentor to at least two people in this room, myself and our chair, and let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Nemiroff. Well, I wish my children were here to hear that, Tony. So uh, it's great to be here. It, Tony reminded me the last time I was here was in 2011. And so, you know, hopefully it won't take another, you know, 12 years for me to come back and visit. Um, I want to say a few things to all of those out, out there in, uh, in Zoom land, uh, but also to the audience that um, these jobs uh, as chairs of departments of psychiatry are not for the faint-hearted. Um, and um, the job of the chair is to enable the success of the residents, junior faculty, senior faculty, and staff. And much of what the chair does is sort of hidden behind the curtain. Um, and our jobs as chairs is to try to enable you to be successful. So most of you probably don't know all of what Dr. Yonkers does. So. Uh, I would suggest that when you're walking down the hall um, in the next week or two and you see her walking down the hall engrossed in her thought, go over uh, and if appropriate, give her a hug and tell her how much you appreciate her. Or at the very least, shake her hand or pat her on the back because, you know, honestly, um, these jobs are not easy. So I'm going to talk to you today about psychedelics. Uh, and this is a new presentation that I put together for you. I've only given... Uh, talked about this very little uh, in, in the past. So I want to say a few things about this. These are my disclosures. All of my research is supported by the NIH. Um, I serve as a consultant to a number of companies, and I serve on a number of nonprofit um, advisory boards. I own two patents that have no commercial value, unfortunately. So I want to make a distinction here that I think is really important and is lost uh, in the lay press that I want you all to really appreciate. And that is um, the, the discussion surrounding psychedelics has two fundamentally different components. The first component that I am not going to talk about today at all is whether psychedelics are to be available to individuals without a psychiatric disorder who want to experience um, some deep introspection, get in touch with spirituality. Um, uh, and that is a philosophical debate that experiment will be run because Oregon has legalized psilocybin. And I'll talk about that a little later in relationship to therapeutics. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. I think there's some inherent dangers in the um, uh, unregulated availability of psychedelics, uh, but whether psychedelics can provide an enriching spiritual experience that could help one actualize their potential is an interesting question, but it's not what I'm gonna talk with you about today. What I'm gonna talk with you about today 
is are psychedelics a potential um, novel treatment for um, two disorders for which we really need additional treatments, and that is major depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm going to show you what the available data are, but to start with, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. And the reason I launched the Center for Psychedelic uh, Research and Therapy at the University of Texas uh, is really two reasons. One, this field needs scientific rigor, and it's already ahead of its skis. And so um, if all you have to do is Google psilocybin and blank, and you will be inundated with anecdotal reports from various individuals who feel like it's changed their life and cured their PTSD or depression, et cetera. So we need to apply the same kind of scientific rigor we would for any treatment. And as you can see, the database up till now is pretty meager. And then secondly, all these Californians who moved to Texas to escape um, uh, income tax, uh, uh, all apparently went to Costa Rica, stayed for a week in a yurt and experienced psychedelics. And they are throwing money at me um, for this psychedelic center. And we've raised $3 million in eight months, um, which is remarkable. So where I'm coming from is treatment resistant depression. So as Kim and Tony know, this is sort of the bulk of my own clinical practice is seeing patients who have failed evidence-based treatments. And as you can see, we have a medley of treatments that are available, FDA approved or evidence-based treatments, ranging from uh, psychopharmacology to evidence-based psychotherapy to a transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, uh, which has had you know, major advances in the last year. Uh, to vagal nerve stimulation. Um, so there are a lot of treatment uh, uh, availability. Having said that, a substantial number of patients do not respond to conventional treatments. And the problem with treatment-resistant depression is that it is characterized by an extremely high suicide risk, um, significant relapse, even after you've responded to treatment, the chance of you relapsing subsequently is very high. Um, An overutilization of, of emergency departments, um, a, um, a risk for um, uh, uh, poor outcome with comorbid medical disorders, including heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer. Now, one of the underlying um, uh, contributors to treatment-resistant depression is childhood maltreatment. And this is one of the most um, um, uh, often quoted, uh, but one of the hallmarks of modern psychiatry is our appreciation that patients with um, uh, uh, treatment-resistant depression with a history of childhood maltreatment, which is a substantial uh, minority of patients, but very substantial, um, are the worst responders. Um, uh, to conventional treatments. And, you know, we've documented this and, and I'm going to talk about this in my uh, research uh, presentation, um, uh, uh, journal, uh, whatever you call it, club. Yes, um, uh, a little bit later today. Um, and one of the questions that we'd like to ask in the psychedelic world is, is this group of patients potentially responsive uh, more responsive to psychedelics than patients with TRD that are not. But the strategies for managing treatment-resistant depression, all of you know what they are, and they're very straightforward, right? So everyone in this room and everyone online knows what's on this slide. You optimize the dose, you get patients up to 450 milligrams of venlafaxin. If that doesn't work, you switch to another drug, uh, Dr. Yonkins and I and Dr. Rothschild were talking about MAO inhibitors last night and how effective they are. You can augment with various agents, lithium, T3, atypical antipsychotics. You could always go to TMS or ECT. But the fact is, is that there are a substantial number of patients that don't respond to treatment. And this is um, a study I wanted to show you because we talk about the efficacy of atypical antipsychotics in converting non-responders to responders. But the goal, of course, is remission. And this is the two pivotal trials 
that led to aripiprazole being approved as an augmenting agent for um, non-responders to SSRIs. And you can see here in both of these studies, the patients, all of whom are on antidepressants, treated with placebo in the lighter color bar or aripiprazole in the darker color uh, brown uh, bar. And you can see that the placebo remission rate was about 15%, but the aripiprazole remission rate is 25, 26%. It's not great. So there are a substantial number of patients that, that do not respond to conventional treatments. And so everybody said the answer was esketamine. And if you haven't read this article, you really need to read it. It's published in Lancet Psychiatry, and it fundamentally raised the question of whether esketamine should have ever been approved by the FDA, because the database is extremely weak. One of the three pivotal trials failed, the geriatric trial, and then there were two other trials um, in, in the acute trial, um, um, men did not respond, a limited age group responded. Um, and in the relapse prevention trial, one single site in Poland for which had a zero response rate on placebo and 100% response rate on esketamine ended up actually uh, getting to a, a, a P of less than 0.05. So I think the data on esketamine being an effective antidepressant is extremely questionable. So why psychedelics? Why would we imagine that psychedelics would have a role here? Well, the need is very clear. No one would disagree with that. And we know from the STAR-D study that if you treat people with up to 40 milligrams of citalopram, that less than a third of the patients get into remission. And that as you add additional treatments, you can bring some people into remission, but many patients never achieve remission. So that's a big deal. Um, PTSD is even worse. So no one even talks about remission and PTSD, if you think about it. With all the papers you've read about treatment of PTSD and think about the pharmacotherapies approved for PTSD, namely sertraline and paroxetine or FDA approved, but the effect size of SSRIs and SNRIs in treating PTSD is actually pretty meager. And for those of you who treat patients with PTSD, you know that the true remission, returning patients to their previous pre-morbid state is, is actually relatively rare. So what has been suggested is that psychedelics with some kind of psychotherapy, we're gonna talk about this, um, in a minute, has some potential for treating these um, tr so-called treatment-resistant patients. So let's start, start off and talk about what is a psychedelic. Well, it, it's a class of compounds that alter, expand, or intensify one state of conscious awareness or sensory perceptions. It was actually named by Humphrey Osmond, um, uh, and that's where the term psychedelic comes from, mind and mani manifest, mind manifesting. And we know that it has been used um, uh, for millennia by different cultures. Um, and, and so these cultures were not cultures that had contact with each other, but a variety of cultures in South America in particular um, uh, uh, harvested uh, various types of psychedelics from natural products. And the psychedelics received the most attention recently um, is, is psilocybin. Now, the story really begins um, with Albert Hoffman. And Albert Hoffman was a chemist. And in 1938, working at the Sandoz Laboratory in Basel, Switzerland, um, he was synthesizing various compounds, one of which turned out to be LSD. Um, and um, in 1943, he got some LSD on his hands. And on his way home on the bicycle, he noted that the walls of the buildings were moving and breathing and colors seemed very vivid. And that was sort of the first trip, if you will. Um, 
This drug was actually marketed very briefly. It was called Delsid LSD. It was manufactured by Sandoz. Uh, it was quickly realized that it wasn't going to be a treatment, at least at that time. And it was given to investigators. And that led to um, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert. This is when Dr. Yonkers and I were young. Um, and I went to Woodstock. So I, I, I remember um, the announcements when Jimi Hendrix, who's shown here, was playing. There was an announcement that the brown acid was bad. Don't take it. And several people around me said, oh, my God. So, um, and so this, this era in the mid-1960s and early 1970s brought psychedelics uh, forward. It was during a time uh, the United States government um, became extremely um, concerned about psychedelics. And they immediately, uh, uh, probably because of some misuse by investigators, um, ended up classifying them as Schedule One drugs, which are drugs of abuse without any medicinal value. So here's what they are. And the major psychedelics are psilocybin, mescaline, dimethyltryptamine. We'll talk about MDMA, which is a little different. They're often um, classified into three different groups of compounds. Um, ketamine, which is really not a classic psychedelic, but is a dissociative anesthetic. Um, uh, all of the 5-HT2A agonists shown here, LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, DMT, 5-MeO, DMT, um, and then uh, the classic psychedelics, and then MDMA or ecstasy, which is called an ataktogen or an actogen, which has a fundamentally different mechanism of action and different um, um, uh, experience than these other uh, agents. So what do psychedelics do? Well, the, depending on which psychedelic you take, um, the um, effect lasts somewhere between four and eight hours. Psilocybin is in the six to eight hour range. Uh, some mescaline, it can be even longer. Um, uh, some of the others uh, might be shorter, but it produces a very clear visual and auditory uh, uh, perception changes. Um, uh, individuals often feel um, uh, disconnected from their body. They often feel that they are viewing themselves um, in a very uh, unusual way. Um, they feel um, all extraordinarily connected to the universe, to other species. Um, they view themselves as being a small part of a larger whole. Um, most individuals find it um, um, very intense and can be anxiety provoking, very panic provoking. And I'll show you some data from the clinical trials about this. Others find it very euphoric. And then there are cognitive changes. Um, needless to say, during a psychedelic experience, it's pretty difficult to concentrate. You wouldn't want to be studying um, uh, for the board exams uh, under the influence of psychedelics. Um, but individuals also feel that they um, experience an increase in creativity and insight uh, and particularly like to explore um, some of their past experiences. There are some physiological changes that can occur, and some of these can be um, um, of medical concern, including a cardiovascular side effects, uh, particularly tachycardia, increase in blood pressure, increased respiratory rate. Certain uh, psychedelics, particularly ayahuasca, is associated with high rates of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea that you know obviously uh, passes. MDMA in particular is, is, is associated with um, a social um, awareness. It's known as the intimacy drug um, and, and individuals are characterized as feeling more love and compassion towards others. So this is a term that has crept into the psychedelic literature. It was coined by Timothy Leary, and it talked about how the effects of psychedelics are extremely individualized. So this is different than most uh, agents um, uh, that we would prescribe. Uh, and, you know, maybe it's a little bit like alcohol. You know, some people 
are happy when they're inebriated, or other people are irritable, other people are prone to being angry. Uh, so Timothy Leary described how set was important, um, which means um, one's personality, one's um, interaction with others, what one's expectations are. And then setting has to do with the environment in which the drug is being consumed. So it's different taking a psychedelic at Woodstock than it is at uh, being in a clinical trial office um, uh, with, with individuals asking you all sorts of questions about how you feel and, and measuring your EEG or blood pressure. Um, so although this is true of probably all psychoactive drugs, it's particularly true of psychedelics. So the history is sort of interesting. Um, after the Nixon administration took the lead on banning psychedelics and all research for psychedelics were prohibited, we call that the dark ages. Um, uh, Rick Strassman, who is a psychiatrist at University of New Mexico, did a study of, of dimethyltryptamine in normal healthy volunteers, published it in JAMA Psychiatry. This is followed by a small study of psilocybin in healthy volunteers. And then um, in 2011, the first study of MDMA uh, uh, for PTSD, um, and then um, uh, a study done at Hopkins and then NYU looking at psilocybin in patients with terminal um, neoplastic disease. Um, and then in 2016, uh, Robin Carhart Harris, who was in London, is now at University of California, San Francisco, uh, published his report. I'll show you the data. So how do psychedelics work? Well, all psychedelics, putting MDMA aside, um, are agonists at the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor. And this is a artist's depiction of how that works. Having said that, I was chatting with Tony and Ben about this last night. There's some evidence, although this may be the case, it might not be the basis for the therapeutic effects of psychedelics. So, uh, you know, absolutely a grist for the mill. But you could see this sort of art, artist uh, rendition here. Um, and we could talk about why this may or may not be the case in terms of mechanism of action. MDMA is a totally different drug. Remember, it's an amphetamine analog, and so it blocks dopamine transport, it blocks serotonin transport. Um, uh, it also um, increases release of dopamine, serotonin, to a lesser extent, um, uh, norepinephrine. So there is some data um, to suggest that one of the things that psychedelics do is that they change uh, uh, neural activity, no surprise there relative to the behavioral effects, that they change uh, neural activity and in particular uh, make changes in connectivity between different reasons. Put another way, um, networks that normally don't talk to each other in the brain appear to increase the crosstalk between these areas, whereas areas that um, normally talk a lot to each other tend to uh, do so less frequently. Now, um, and, and you could look at each of these brain areas and you could begin to look at differences between uh, psilocybin and placebo. Um, one of the one of the obvious uh, caveats to all the research on psychedelics that you need to be aware of is that you, they can't be blinded, right? The cornerstone of, of great clinical research is blinding both the subjects and the raters and investigators to what treatment group receives what. Well, if you're receiving 25 milligrams of psilocybin, you're going to know it compared to placebo, and the person who's reading you is going to know it. And if you don't have blinded trials, and this has been an obstacle in the field, and there has not been a solution to this yet, and that's something we might want to talk about. So there's a lot going on in the imaging field, both in um, psychedelics in particular, but in imaging in general. I've been pretty critical of brain imaging studies 
largely because I'll just ask you this question. Have you ever read a negative brain imaging study? Have you ever seen a paper in the American Journal of Psychiatry? I'm on the editorial board, but have you ever read a paper in JAMA Psychiatry or in the American Journal looking at either resting state fMRI or some provocative test that had no finding? Of course you haven't. And so how many of you have been in an MRI? Okay. So you remember what it's like, you know, you're in what feels like a coffin, right? You got the scanners right up to your nose and you're not in any resting state at all, right? You're lying there. You're thinking, how long is this going to go on? Um, you're thinking about your to-do list. You got some notes to catch up on. You got to pick your kids up, right? You're, you're, that's not the resting state. Not to mention that it's really loud, right? And so you got headphones on. Maybe you're listening to The Grateful Dead or Vivaldi. But, you know, the brain is a sensitive organ. So not surprising if you take a drug that alters your consciousness, you're going to see brain imaging changes. I have no idea what they mean. So let's talk about so-called um, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. This is sort of what it tends to look like. So um, I, I just want to go over this with you um, so you can understand the way this generally works. So patients and, and Tony and I are both sites for the COMPASS treatment-resistant depression study. So um, this is some variant on the theme, but fundamentally patients are screened. One of the criticisms of the early work I'll show you is almost all the volunteers had previously taken psychedelics. They weren't naive, right? Who volunteers for psychedelic studies? That's a problem because of expectation. So patients get screened. And in this study by Robin, uh, they, they had an MRI and they have a preparatory session, which fundamentally means we're going to tell you what's going to happen during your experience. And then they you know, get the questionnaires with all the dimensional ratings for depression and anxiety. And in this particular study, they were given a low dose of psilocybin. That's an attempt to get away from the placebo effect. So one milligram of psilocybin doesn't do anything. And the question is, well, what about five milligrams or three milligrams? Will it tickle your brain a little bit so that you know something happened, but it's not 25 or 30 milligrams? So in this study, there was a low dose followed by a high dose of psilocybin. And during the experience, um, uh, the patients uh, sit with therapists. Now, usually two therapists because there was some shenanigans with the single therapist and some, uh, some of you saw the JAMA psychiatry piece uh, that just came out, which was very concerning to say the least. Um, but understand that during that eight hour period, when you have headphones on, you're listening to music from your playlist, those two people are there to ensure your safety. They're not doing any therapy. Let's be clear about that. They're just sitting there holding your hand, reassuring you that things are going to be fine if you need help. Then there are so-called integration sessions that follow. So what is the therapy about? So the therapy in the integration sessions is not therapy as you have been trained to understand therapy. It's not CBT. It's not IPT. It's not behavioral activation. It's actually a throwback to when Tony and I and Kim were in training. It's more of an open-ended psychodynamic psychotherapy. So what do, what do we say to patients when they come back after their psychedelics? What was it like for you? What would you like to talk about? You were reliving your experiences with your parents. What was that like? It, it's not psychotherapy as we understand it. And it's really important that, that you understand that. So I'm going to show you a picture of the rooms, but, but the dosing sessions are here exactly as, as I'm describing them in this PowerPoint. Um, and so at best, you could say the therapy is supportive therapy. 
with a great deal of empathy. Patients will say to me, I felt like I was back in Afghanistan. I saw, you know, bodies. It was horrible. I relived that experience. And I, I or the therapist would say, it must have been really difficult, right? This is what so-called integration is about. This is what the rooms look like. So, Tony, I don't know if you got your furniture yet, but we just, yeah. So we we have received our furniture. Uh, the compass studies use the same room, so it's standardized. So you get the same lamp, you get the same lighting, you get the same couch. And this is fundamentally what you're seeing on the right is during a dosing session, the patients have um, uh, uh, eye covering and they have headphones. Uh, they're given a blanket because often patients shiver when they take psychedelics. And as I said, this is what the quote therapy is like. So this is not evidence-based therapy. And I have concerns. I have a paper submitted to the American Journal of Psychiatry where I fundamentally asked the question, what is evidence-based psychotherapy? What is it? And how is it going to be regulated? And who needs to be trained in it? And there's a reason why uh, I'm, I'm emphasizing that, because you'll see um, why in a couple of minutes. So you can see the commonalities between evidence-based psychotherapy at the top, and then you see all these differences at the bottom. So this is more like a rent-a-friend than it is evidence-based psychotherapy. Um, and um, understand this in the concept of this being available in Oregon starting January 1st, right? And we'll talk about how that, that's going to work. So let me now go over the data with you. So um, this is Grobe's study that was published in, in JAMA Psychiatry on um, the use of um, uh, psilocybin for patients with anxiety who had stage four um, neoplastic disease. And the target was depression, anxiety, and hopelessness. It was a small study, 12 subjects. They all are between the ages of 36 and 58. They all had stage four um, neoplastic disease and they had a, a, um, a, a, a anxiety diagnosis. So this was a uh, within subic double blind design. They used niacin um, uh, as the um, um, placebo and niacin can cause facial flushing, but I can assure you it's not like a psychedelic. They didn't ask the patients if they could tell the difference, incidentally. And that's one of the problems with most of the studies. And what you see here is a small improvement in anxiety with the psychedelic. Um, uh, but what was remarkable about it is that this small effect persisted for a long time. It appeared the patients uniformly said, I feel better. But this is not remission, right? Then a second study was done uh, at Hopkins. The first was at NYU. Second study was done at Hopkins. Um, and then the third study was done at NYU. And, and all of these um, studies have found some positive effects in terms of end of life um, uh, measures. So 17 outcomes, 11 showed group differences. And I just want you to look at this for a minute. Um, it gives you a good idea of the magnitude of the effect this could have. So all terminally ill uh, patients, um, and you can see in red uh, the high dose of psilocybin, in blue the low dose, and you could see the BDI scores, you could see the HAMD scores. That's a very large drop in Hamilton depression scores, very large drop. This is one of the bigger effects we've seen in any study. And you see that they persist um, uh, for quite a number of months. That was sort of exciting. Well, what about TRD, which is, you know, really of particular interest to me? Um, and this was Robin's study. It was an open study of 10 and then 25 milligrams. I showed you the design of that study already as sort of a prototype psilocybin design. 
It was t- 12 patients with moderate to severe depression who had failed previous antidepressant medication. The dosing was separated by seven days. Um, and the good news, it was generally well tolerated. It had um, some transient side effects, including 100% of the patients felt anxious during the treatment period. 75% said they had confusion, a third had headache, a third um, had nausea. But if you look at the treatment effect using the quids, you could see a, a quite a significant antidepressant effect in this study, but open study. Everybody knew they were getting it. Many of these patients had had uh, had been experienced psychedelic users in the past. So I don't want to bore you with all the numbers at the bottom. You all can have my presentation to go over. But there was a, a very significant effect for those of you who who you know do research in in depression. A, a, a change from thirty one on the Madras to nine point seven is a big effect. There's no question about it. I wish all of the subsequent data I'm going to show you. Um, so then this study came out two years ago. And I want to focus on this for a few reasons. Came out of Hopkins, funded by a donor. Uh, 27 patients were randomized to either getting psych- psilocybin immediately or being sort of on the wait list and then getting it later. Two doses. Um, uh, one was a pretty high dose, 20 milligrams, and the other, the highest dose ever used, 30 milligrams. So that's higher than the COMPASS studies. Um, and they were not on any other antidepressant treatment. So 15 people received the psilocybin immediately, 12 were delayed. There were a couple of dropouts. As you can see, it was an eight-week protocol with 18 in-person visits. Those of you who know clinical trials, 18 in-person visits usually engenders a tremendous placebo response. So just sort of keep that in mind. They got eight hours of preparation over two weeks and then two to three hours of integration afterwards. But here's the data and there's the HAMD scores and again, You see delayed treatment showed no change in depression. Um, There's a pretty substantial change. About about half of the patients were actually in remission uh, by week eight. So that's pretty pretty substantial. Um, What was interesting is the first dose of 20 milligrams was effective. The second dose didn't add anything um, to the uh, therapeutic effects. Uh, But again, there was no blinding, there was no active or inactive comparator. Um, And now I I, want to spend a minute, and I know this is hard to see, so I apologize for sticking this ridiculous table in here. This was buried in a supplement in JAMA Psychiatry, Table 8 of this paper. And if you look at it, you'll see why the authors buried it. This is what the patients said about the experience. Now, I want you to read it from the top, and 92% said they felt like crying, 79% sadness, 77% said they were suffering emotionally and physically, 71% said their heart was beating, they could feel it, two-thirds said they were shaking and trembling, the same number said they had a pressure on their chest or their abdomen, 60% feelings of grief, the same amount, isolation and loneliness, despair, anxiousness, feeling isolated, evidence of fear. And then as you go down the list, you see some pretty scary side effects. I feel um, I feel that profound experience of my own death, 31% of subjects. In looking at this, I felt I was dead or dying quarter of the patients. So I want you to think about this in relationship to the potential widespread availability of psychedelics without medical supervision. What would that look like? So then this report came out in um, the New England Journal of Medicine. 
comparing for the first time psilocybin and an SSRI. 59 patients were randomized to three groups, 25 milligrams of psilocybin, one milligram of psilocybin, um, uh, uh, followed by escitalopram. So it was sort of an interesting design. They had to stop their antidepressants four weeks before. And what they found was both treatments worked in treating depression, but psilocybin was numerically better, but not statistically better uh, in this six-week um, post-dosing study. And psilocybin was administered twice. Um, but if you look at the various secondary measures, psilocybin appeared to, to be better than escitalopram. And I think the dosing was 10 or 20 uh, milligrams. Um, but again, it wasn't blinded. Uh, there was a short discontinuation period for antidepressant washout. Um, patients were self-referred and get this, they, they were asked which treatment would you like to be assigned to? And they almost all said, well, I'd rather be in the psilocybin group. I know, go figure. So this is a follow-up to that study that was published recently at 12 month follow-up. And they fundamentally um, uh, stated that, that, um, that many patients continue to um, show benefit 12, 12 months later. So then there's this paper, which I reviewed for the New England Journal of Medicine. So this came out, as you could see, relatively recently. Um, this was the largest psilocybin study ever conducted. And you can see here um, that there were three groups, 110 and 25 milligrams of psilocybin, the one milligram being the, the placebo group, the 10 milligrams being the, maybe it'll have a small effect, but not a robust effect. Um, and they ended up with about 75 to 80 patients per group. And this was the result. And if you look here at the mean change in MADRA scores, you could see it's sort of a dose response curve. So 25 milligrams uh, better than um, uh, 10 milligrams. 10 milligrams wasn't statistically significant. Uh, actually, as you could see here from the one milligram dose. And that's why they're going to go with the 25 milligram dose. If you look at the response rates at week three, and the remission rates at week three, and then sustained response at week 12, you could see that the response rates, remember, which is only a 50% reduction in symptoms, was pretty meager, right? I mean, that's pretty meager. Look at it, 37%, 19%, 18%, 37 is the, is the high dose. Um, remission, a third of the patients by 12 weeks, 20%. That's not better than aripiprazole. So let's be clear about it. So here's what worries me. There are 25 states have considered 74 bills to um, reform or legalize psilocybin in their states. 10 have been enacted and 32 are active. Um, most of them um, specifically cite psilocybin, some MDMA, um, and, and most of them are wanting to decriminalize uh, psychedelics, but others um, also speak to issues of training and licensure, which we should get to. And this is what it looks like. So Oregon has, um, has in fact enacted a law to make psilocybin um, widely available. And in the bill, it's, it states unequivocally that this is not capital NOT under medical supervision. So the way this is going to work is that patients are going to go to the mushroom store. I suspect they'll be, this will join the cannabis store. So we'll have the cannabis slash mushroom store. And you will go, uh, uh, you will go there and you will ask their advice because they're so knowledgeable and they will give you um, a certain uh, number of mushrooms. Now understand that the content of psilocybin varies from mushroom to mushroom, from species to species. 
And then what the um, uh, uh, provider will tell you is that you will cut off a certain amount of mushroom and you will weigh it. You'll cut off a certain amount of the cap or the stock and you'll weigh it and your dose, mm, you look, Ben, you look like about a five gram kind of guy. Tony, you're maybe a four gram. Okay. And then you're supposed to take it to a um, therapist. And the therapist is, does not have to have a doctoral degree. The therapist doesn't have to have a master's degree. Their therapist has to do 20 hours of online training to be a psychedelic therapist in Oregon. No medical screening. So I'm going to harp on this. What do you think about your patients who have like a strong history of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia? You think this might be a good idea? There will be no screening. There'll be no medical screening. So I published this case uh, of a patient of mine um, in the December issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry, uh, which was just, I, th I thought, emblematic of what we're going to experience. So a 32-year-old woman uh, graduated summa cum laude from an Ivy school that um, Kim knows very well. And then um, uh, we disguised her occupation, but she graduated from a professional school in the same institution, also summa cum laude. And she had a fabulous job with a firm on the West Coast. The only time she'd ever been treated, psychiatry, was with 50 milligrams of sertraline um, while an undergraduate at, at your institution. That was all. And she did fine. And um, oh, sorry, with venlafaxine, about 75 milligrams. So in the fall of 2020, with three of her colleagues in the firm, they sort of said, we're all going to do psilocybin. Why don't you come with us? She said, OK. So she ingested psilocybin and had a, as she described it, a fabulous experience. She thought this was so incredibly enriching and personal um, that she had some leftover. So she decided by herself the next day to do it again. Within a couple of hours, she developed severe manic and psychotic symptoms. And for the next three to four months, she slept no more than three to four hours a night. She had intrusive racing thoughts and she had paranoid delusions. She decided that the people in her firm were, in fact, uh, monitoring her. So she took a hammer to the wall of her condo uh, and broke into the wall looking for the wires and the cameras. She became convinced they were there even though she couldn't find it. She impulsively sold her condo. She continued to have these delusions. She was admitted to a hospital on the East Coast where she was diagnosed with schizophrenia somewhat late onset in her 30s. She was marinated in antipsychotic drugs. <clears throat> she spent all of her savings on psychiatric care, $450,000, because she ran out of any insurance. Um, and so by the time I saw her, she was no longer manic. She was in what we would call in the old days in the defect state. She had no emotion whatsoever. She was absolutely antidonic. Um, she said to me, I have a dog. I raised him since he was a puppy. If he was run over by a truck, I wouldn't feel anything at all. I don't have any joy in life. She said, the only reason I haven't been fired from my job is because of COVID. So I'm working from home and I'm faking it, but I can't function. I can't concentrate. I still can't sleep. I've lost 25 pounds. Um, and I'm thinking that if this is the way life is going to be, I'm going to kill myself. So pretty concerning. She had been marinated in every medication you can imagine, and I'm including stimulants, tricyclics, SNRIs, um, lamotrigine, quetiapine. She also had a... a uh, went to a holistic center in LA where she had um, um, plasmapheresis to take out her, her toxins. She didn't respond to anything. And so Steve Siegel, the chair at, U, uh, uh, at USC and I, ended up um, uh, treating her 
And we arrived at Premopexol, uh, which as you know, is a D2, D3 agonist. Um, and over time, we gradually increased the dose from a half milligram up to four and a half milligrams. And she's now completely euthymic, just on Premopexol and nothing else. And we did a ton more laboratory tests. We thought she might have had an MDA encephalitis. I mean, we, we left no stone unturned. This is the danger, right? Now, just to, I want to finish up with a couple of, of very quick, quick comments. This study just came out uh, in biological psychiatry, and it, it's a study, a two-center study of LSD. Uh, and it says 200 milligrams. That's not right. It's 200 micrograms. 200 milligrams, would, you would not survive. 200 micrograms of LSD. Uh, and this was looking at, at patients, again, with terminal illness, and it showed very significant effects. So you could see here very significant effects and very long-lasting effects um, on anxiety and on depression in patients with life-threatening illness. This study, um, one of the largest effects um, uh, thus far reported is this study by Bogenschutz looking at heavy drinking with psilocybin. <clears throat> and um, this was uh, psilocybin versus diphenhydramine. Again, relatively easy to distinguish those two. Very significant reduction in alcohol consumption. Of course, those of you who do alcohol research know that once you enter alcoholics into a study, the first thing they do is reduce their drinking because they know you're watching. So you see everybody stopped drinking, right? But you can see there was a bigger effect with psilocybin um, than the, in terms of number of drinks per day, heavy drinking days, uh, et cetera. So I'm just going to finish to quickly mention MDMA. It will likely be the first FDA-approved treatment. It's being pushed by the MAPS group. This was the first study in 2011, uh, which looked at MDMA and the treatment of, of treatment-resistant PTSD. Small study, 12 patients treated with MDMA um, and eight, and they have um, psychedelic-assisted therapy as part of this. But this is a big effect. You know the CAPS is the uh, golden standard for measuring PTSD. On the left, you see this big effect compared to diphenhydramine. And then this study um, published in Nature Medicine, um, you can see this very large effect of MDMA in treating PTSD. Uh, there it is. I, I wanted to summarize it for you. Uh, really a, a, a significant effect. And you could look at remitters and responders and you could see the difference between placebo on the left and MDMA on the right. And this does seem to, this is a bigger effect than the psilocybin effects. Well, how do they work? Well, we don't know how they work um, and who, the, the unanswered questions are, who are they good for, if anybody? Um, how much would this cost if it ever got approved? What about dosing? What about microdosing? There's a whole world out there of people who are microdosing psychedelics. I mean, I have patients who say to me, oh, incidentally, I'm, I'm taking um, five milligrams of psilocybin a day. I, really? Right? Oh, and it's really helpful. Or a milligram, Michael Pollan's book about LSD, took a, mil a microgram of, of LSD every day. So these are really, really important questions. And one of the big questions is, could a psychedelic analog that didn't produce a psychedelic experience actually have a therapeutic effect? And there's some evidence that that might be, might be the case. So just to finish, I wanted to tell Tony and Kim in particular, what are we doing at our center? So our strengths are brain imaging, electrophysiology, neuromodulation, um, and we have the largest computer system um, in the United States. And we have a clinical trials program. So we have a large number of veterans uh, in central Texas, many of whom suffer with depression or PTSD. And, um, uh, and a number of Austinites have pushed us uh, into developing the center. So what we're doing 
is we have a study of gold star warrior widows, these individuals who lost uh, a spouse in Iraq or Afghanistan. They're being um, uh, evaluated at our place, then they're sent to Mexico where they're uh, uh, dosed with psychedelics. And then they come back to us where we um, end up doing brain imaging and measuring um, their response. Um, we're very interested in using EEG and brain imaging um, to look at prediction of response. So my own personal um, um, study that I'm, I'm pretty excited about is I think that what psychedelics may do is may change the brain in such a way that it would actually be more responsive to um, evidence-based treatments. So my idea is to treat patients with psilocybin and then treat them with accelerated theta burst TMS to see if the brain has been sufficiently plasticized by the psychedelic in order to then respond um, uh, to uh, TMS in the most tremor resistant depressed patients. And you all know that, that the two major forms of uh, putting ECT aside, two major forms of neuromodulation right now and putting VNS aside are TMS and particularly accelerated theta burst TMS developed at Sanford. And now we're also doing studies with focused ultrasound. So we believe that, that psychedelics do result in an enhanced um, neural plasticity, which might uh, provide a substrate for neuromodulation to be more effective. At least that, that would be our hope. So we're doing the same study you guys are doing, um, which is 25 versus 10 versus one milligram of psilocybin and with a long-term follow-up. Um, and was going to start in December, right? But it's not, it's going to start probably in May. And then we received a $1.2 million gift to do this study comparing psilocybin and RTMS. Um, uh, and it has four arms. So obviously you design it where some patients will get the combination, others will get just psilocybin, others will get just uh, RTMS. And those obviously will use sham um, accelerated TMS as well. So I'm going to stop here. I think I'm on time or almost. Yeah, great. thank you very much. Any questions in the room? Thank you, Dr. Nemiroff. That was fantastic. Uh, you know, it, it's it's interesting to note. So I have two questions. First is a bigger meta question than just a little trivial question. But it, it is interesting, as you point out, that there's the same process in terms of the general population's approach to cannabis and to psychedelics. I mean, we really have a very small evidence base and people cling on to this. So I'd be interested in in your thoughts about that. And I would also wonder why you selected TMS instead of something like acceptance commitment therapy, CBT, something like that for- Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I got to go back to my station. Okay. <laughs> well, first, um, you know, Kim, I was not in favor of the widespread legalization of cannabis, uh, largely because of the data that exposure in adolescents markedly increases risk for schizophrenia. So it goes from you know one percent to four percent, which is a big deal, right? And so, um, and and frankly, if you look at the data in Colorado, the adverse consequences of cannabis legalization have been um, frightening. So particularly, uh, uh, child overdoses from from edibles, veterinary overdoses from edibles, um, increase in car accidents, et cetera, et cetera. It's it's quite predictable. Um, and the second question was selection of TMS as a, Oh, why did I pick TMS? Yeah. So, um, part of it was that the, um, the foundation that gave us, um, the funds were more interested in TMS, uh, than they were in evidence-based psychotherapy. Um, so, but we, I have a proposal, um, to do psychotherapy, I, uh, with Compass, 
And what I, what I, I developed a unique design, which I think would be really cool, which would be to take 100 patients, treat them all with CBT, all of them, and take the non-responders and randomize them to psilocybin or placebo. And that way you'd find out in CBT, everybody would get an evidence-based treatment. So they haven't funded it. Other questions in the room? I would note that in the COMPASS study, they're excluding, even if you have a family history of a psychotic disorder, is an exclusion. Absolutely. And they should. Because of the concern. Do we have time to take on? Oh. I can speak loudly. No, no, no. The Zoom people can't hear you. Oh, yeah. That's true. Um, you mentioned in the functional imaging that it, one of the things that we find is that it connects pieces of the brain that aren't necessarily connected. Um, and the concept of, you know, neuroplasticity, you have heavy and learning, the, the concept that neurons that wire together or fire together, wire together. Um, what are, what are your concerns about kind of chronic exposure or long-term exposure to psychedelics and causing, you know, abnormal brain patterns and psychosis? So, um, you know, in the absence of data, I worry. I mean, I generally don't worry about much because I don't have the anxiety gene, but I would say I'm concerned. And so one of the things we know about pharmaceutical company studies is that there has to be acute and long-term toxicity. It used to be in three species. Now it's in two species. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the COMPASS uh, uh, package largely is, is focused on acute treatment. Right. And there has not been any longstanding um, uh, studies. So there are a couple of companies I've consulted with recently who I think um, um, uh, believe for reasons that are largely anecdotal, that low dose micro dosing of psychedelics does have a therapeutic effect. And in that case, they have to do the long term toxicity studies. But I, I of course, I worry about it. And, and as, as Kim alluded to, I think the widespread use of psychedelics um, is going to, we can't afford in this field to have a tragedy. And so when we were young, the three of us over here, and we were on call in the ED, people would come in on a bad trip. They'd be psychotic. They'd take an LSD or mescaline or, or psilocybin, and they were terrified. And often we had to give them chlorpromazine in order to try to sort of help them break this horrible experience. Um, if there's a rash of that, we had people jump off of buildings because they thought they could fly, right? Sounds crazy, but that happened. And so I'm really concerned that um, uh, in, the, in the best scenario, what would happen is... Um, that the widespread availability would be negated, but the research could continue. I think really an interesting question is the microdosing question. If it turns out that these drugs can be therapeutic at non-psychedelic doses, that would be a game changer. No one's done the study. But if you go on the internet, it says it works. All right, thank you. We probably should stop since we've been running over, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you.